congratulations. You have all chosen to be born at the most important, the most interesting, and the best time in all of human history. So well done. That was a really good decision. At this point, when I say this in a talk in America, I get everybody to jump up and down and give each other high fives. <laughs> but we're in England, and we're at a pensions conference. So let's not do that. Um, instead, give yourself a mental pat on the back, and if you're feeling really ebullient, flash your neighbor a quick nervous smile and don't look to see if he comes back. This whole talk is about why this is the most important and the most interesting time in human history, and this slide shows why it's the, most, it's the best time in human history. I actually think this is quite possibly the most important slide that's ever been put together. I didn't put it together. And it should be compulsory viewing for all millennials. It should be on schools everywhere. And anybody who's ever voted for Corbyn or Sanders or thought of doing that should be forced to look at this slide for four hours every day. This slide shows the entire economic history of the world since Jesus Christ. And as you can see, absolutely nothing happened. Rise and fall of the Roman Empire, rise and fall of the Visigoths, the Moors, Renaissance, nothing happened until we got to the Industrial Revolution. And then things got busy, and we have exponential growth. And there are two reasons for that, two reasons for this exponential growth. One of them, and the reason why millennials and Corbynistas and Sardinistas should uh, be forced to look at this slide a lot, is capitalism. It's a great shame that capitalism doesn't get the credit it deserves. The other reason for this exponential growth is, is the exponential growth in the power of our technology. And increasingly, our most powerful technology is artificial intelligence. So I'm going to do four things in this talk. First, I'm going to explain what AI is, which is harder than you might think, and why it is suddenly all over the media. Second, I'm going to talk about a couple of the things that it's going to do for us in the short term. Then I'm going to invite you in the third part to look a little bit further ahead and at what I call the two singularities. And at that point, I warn you, I'm going to say some things that will make you think that I'm completely crazy. And that's perfectly normal reaction. Just go with it and see what you think at the end. And then fourth, I'm going to issue a call to action. So artificial intelligence is, as I say, hard to define, like uh, other aspects of, of human cognition, like consciousness and creativity, all different things, all hard to define. You know when you see them, but defining them is tricky. Artificial intelligence splits into two. The artificial bit is easy. It means created by humans or possibly by aliens, not by God or by evolution. So that's easy. The intelligence bit is trickier. Um, I'm just going to boil it down to this. It is goal-oriented learning behavior. So if an entity has a goal and it learns in its pursuit of that goal and applies that learning, that is a display of intelligence. AI, despite only relatively recently being all over the media, is quite an old discipline. Um, it started 64 years ago. These gentlemen started it. The, the guy in the red shirt invented the phrase. And they invented it at a, at a conference uh, in America, in Dartmouth College in, in uh, New Hampshire. And that was 64 years ago. And this is them celebrating the 50th anniversary of that conference. Sadly, they are not able to celebrate any further anniversaries of that content conference because they have all succumbed to a bug in human software, which we call death. And death is something that we should do a lot more about. I'll come back to that. We know that AI is our most powerful technology because it has thrashed us at a series of competitions which we regard as being very challenging and where we put up the best humans that we had to offer. So back in 1997, Gary Kasparov, probably the best human player of chess ever, lost to IBM's Deep Blue. Kasparov accused IBM of cheating, and he was almost certainly right. Um, but Deep Blue was better than him. And he's cheered up a lot now. He goes around the world saying that it's all going to be fine. We'll live happily ever after with our machines. Then um, in 2011, another IBM system um, uh, beat the world's best player of a TV quiz show called Jeopardy. The system was called Watson after one of the founders of IBM. And this time, the, the human loser, a man called Ken Jennings, was much more gracious. And he put this sign up on his, his board saying, I, for one, welcome our future robot overlords. So that's where that phrase comes from. Then something interesting happened in 2016. 
a company called DeepMind. You'll hear more about DeepMind. They're a, the SAS of deep learning, if you like. They're based in North London, but they're owned by Google. They've got well over 200 PhDs working away on, on AI. And they produced a system which beat the world's best ever, probably, human player of the board game Go, which is a much, much more complicated go game than chess. And interestingly, it's very important in China. It's regarded as very good training for military strategists. And as a result of this competition, China went all in on AI. They hadn't really taken it so seriously before. Now China is determined to become the world leader in AI. DeepMind went on to do a series of other things. Um, AlphaGo was the, was the system that beat Lisa Doll. They then produced uh, Alpha, AlphaGo Zero and then Alpha Zero. Uh, Alpha, and, and the difference with those systems is that they don't get loaded up with past games of Go. And Alpha Zero is also the best chess player in the world. Uh, they've also gone on to, to release Alpha Star, which is grandmaster level of, a, of an online strategy game, which is even more complicated than a board game. So DeepMind keeps going from strength to strength. But it was last year that uh, we really got our comeuppance because an AI system developed in Singapore assembled an IKEA chair in nine minutes. <laughs> and it didn't swear. <laughs> and I think that we can all agree that that's it. That's, that's game over for the humans. <laughs> the last two challenges, Go and, and uh, the IKEA assembly, were different from the previous two because they employed a new form of AI. So in 2012, there was a big bang in AI because Jeff Hinton, a British computer scientist who works for Google, figured out how to apply a well-established branch of statistics called machine learning to artificial intelligence. Machine learning has been around for a long time, um, but it hadn't been able to be used in AI because we didn't have the compute power and we didn't have the volume of data. It's really hard to explain what machine learning is, but let's try this. If any of you have been strategy consultants, you were told not to boil the ocean. You were told, don't go and amass all the data you can think of. Start with a hypothesis, and then go and get data to test that hypothesis. And that's a perfectly sensible approach if you're a human. If you're a machine, what you do instead is you go and get all the data in the world, and then you see what patterns emerge from it. Uh, it's been described as, if you want to find a needle, first of, all, first of all, start off with a haystack. So that's what machine learning is, and applying it to AI did something really interesting. It made it work. So as I said, AI is 64-odd years old, but until the, the Big Bang, it hadn't worked in the sense it didn't make money. It had done some interesting things. It won chess and so on, but it hadn't made money, and now it makes a lot of money. Google and Facebook have stolen the advertising industry from Rupert Murdoch. I, for one, don't particularly uh, regret that. Rupert Murdoch does regret it, and it's one of the reasons why we have a tech lash. Uh, and we all hate Facebook and Google now. AI has only just begun to penetrate the rest of the economy. At the moment, it's still largely a preserve of the tech giants, but it is starting to penetrate the rest of the economy, and that is something that's going to go on for a long time. Now, it's important to, to stress, the AIs we have now are narrow artificial intelligence. They can play the perfect chess move, a godlike chess move, but they don't notice that the room they're in is burning down. Uh, they can't tie their shoelaces. They couldn't get into this room. They don't even know they're playing chess. They are narrow AI. The Terminator is not just around the corner. However, they are very impressive. Thanks to machine learning, machines can now recognize faces better than you can. That's really impressive because facial recognition is a human superpower. They are overtaking us in speech recognition, and they're getting better and better at natural language processing. That's the activity of taking some information in, in natural language, processing it, doing something useful with it, and returning the result again in natural language. We'll come back to that. All of this is possible thanks to the incredible growth in the power of our computers. This is really the underlying story for the whole thing. You've probably heard that the smartphone in your pocket has more compute power than NASA had when they sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. And that is absolutely true, but it's out of date. A toaster, a good toaster, now has more compute power than NASA had when they sent Neil Armstrong to the moon. And to me, that just says how incredibly brave Neil Armstrong and the rest of them were. <laughs> I would not, I don't know about you, but I would not go into space relying on the intelligence of a toaster. The other thing that you need to make 
machine learning apply to AI is tons and tons of data. And we are producing tons and tons of data. Uh, every, the, the, about 90% of all the data we have now was created in the last two years. And that will be true next year, and it'll be true the year after, and so on. So that's what AI is and why we should be paying attention to it, why it suddenly becomes so all-pervasive in the media. Let's go on to the second phase, which is what's going to happen in the, in the near term. A couple of things that are going to happen in the near term. Firstly, our machines, our smartphones in particular. Smartphones is where you find most AI at the moment. Search, translate, maps, miracles created by Google and Facebook. And they're all in this. And at the moment, Siri and her friends Alexa and Cortana <coughs> uh, is a bit dumb. Siri is a bit silly. Siri can answer a question. But if you ask a supplementary question, he, she, or it is usually completely uh, flummoxed. But in the next five, 10 years, you are going to have conversations with your smartphone. Siri is going to go from being silly to being smart, and indeed to being sexy. And this, of course, is Siri being sexy. <laughs> if you doubt that, if you think that sounds preposterous, use your favorite search engine to look up Google Duplex. It's a demo of a, of a natural, natural language processing system. It has conversations. They're very limited. They're, only, they're, they're very specific applications, but it's very impressive. And Google's just recently uh, announced it hasn't revealed, they haven't done demos yet, another natural language processing system called MENA. I think during this year, we'll hear a lot about MENA. So conversations with our machines is something that's coming in the, in the near future. And they're going to, that's going to be quite significant. And then the other thing is self-driving cars. Now, I know that James Arbib talked about this uh, in the session last year, so that's good. He's done some of my heavy lifting. I don't have to go into too much detail. These things are coming. We don't know when they will be here. Uh, there's a joke in engineering circles that if you have any big project, the first 99% of the project takes the first 99% of the time, which sounds reasonable enough. The second 1%, the last 1% of the project, takes the second 99% of the time. And we're in that 99% now with self-driving vehicles. So uh, there's a lot of money being spent on developing these things. There's lots of pilots. There's about 50-odd companies uh, in America testing them on roads. They almost always have a safety driver uh, in the front. Google has a spin-out company called Waymo. And in a suburb of Phoenix, they have cars which occasionally do not have a safety driver in the front. So members of the public who have not signed NDAs, they don't work for Google, they sit in the back, and there is nobody in the front driving this car around. So it's not far until we get to the point when these things are ready for prime time. But they'll be expensive, and they will be tightly controlled. Everybody's being extremely conservative, which is the way it should be. I think what we are going to see in the next probably five years, and certainly within 10 years, is we're going to start to see self-driving taxis and probably self-driving vans. And then things will move very quickly. And we should welcome that. Because at the moment, humans kill 1.35 million people every year around the world. Road accidents is the biggest single cause of death if you're between 5 and 29. There's a holocaust going on out there. And these things can stop that. So we should welcome that. Now, because of these short-term developments and many others, there is an enormous amount of money going into AI research. A lot of it, obviously, from these, uh, these tech titans in America, G-Mafia, to give them their latest acronym. Um, these guys spend an enormous amount on R&D, and most of it, or at least lots of it, goes on AI. To give you an example, Amazon spends half on R&D every year of what the UK spends. And when I say the UK, I mean the UK companies, all UK companies, all UK universities, all UK government agencies and departments. Amazon spends half of that. And a lot of what Amazon spends its R&D on is AI. That's not true of the UK. So it gives you a scale of the, of the spend going on here. China has its AI giants, uh, Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, Google, Amazon, Facebook, more or less. And these companies are also spending similar amounts of money on AI. And unlike in the States, in China, the government is spending a huge amount on AI research. What we have at the moment is an AI duopoly. Because here is a chart of all the great European AI companies. There are none. And this is a problem. We need to do something about this. Because to have a duopoly, 
over the world's most powerful technology in the hands of America and China, whoever's running them, I'll make no comments about whoever's running them, but whoever's running them is not a good thing. It isn't entirely impossible that we could go from having a cold war between two nuclear superpowers to having a code war between two AI superpowers. Europe should be in this game. And a lot of people think that the big problem that stops Europe being in this game is the lack of a single market. We have very smart people. We have brilliant universities turning out great researchers. We've got lots of money. We just don't have a single market in the way that America and China do. So look, let's look a little bit further ahead. And this is all driven, as I said, by the exponential growth in the power of our computers. And that's known as Moore's law. Moore's law is the observation. It isn't a law. There's no reason why it should happen other than expectations and plans. It's the observation that machines get twice as expensive, sorry, twice as powerful every 18 months or so. And you will hear, as we've been hearing for 15 years at least, that Moore's law is dead or dying. It's not true. It's evolving. And Moore's law has always evolved. I won't bore you with the details of clock speeds and chip sizes. Um, but machines are continuing to get twice as powerful every 18 months, and that's going to continue for quite a long time to come. There is plenty more. more. Exponential growth is incredibly powerful. So here's a thought experiment. Imagine that you walk out of that door and you walk 30 steps. You'd go about 30 meters. Imagine you could take 30 exponential steps. So your first step was one meter, your second step was two meters, your third was four, and your fourth was eight. Where would 30 steps take you? I'll bet there's a number of people in the room who know it would take you to the moon. But in fact, that's not quite right. That Your 29th step would take you to the moon, and your 30th step would bring you all the way back again. Exponential growth is really, really powerful, and it's backloaded. The impressive stuff happens later on. And because of this exponential growth, because of Moore's law, the machines we have in 10 years' time will be well over 100 times more powerful than the machines we have today. The machines we have in 20 years' time will be 8,000 times more powerful than the machines we have today. And the machines we have in 30 years will be a million times more powerful than the ones we have today. That is why AI is so significant. OK, so now we're at the third part, where I invite you to look a little further into the future, and this is where things do get a little bit crazy. Because I think we're heading towards two singularities. Singularity is a word from physics. It means a point in a process where a variable becomes infinite. The classic example is a black hole. At the center of a black hole, the gravitational field becomes infinite. And the effect of that is that the laws of physics stop working. And you don't really know what happens after that. And it was first applied to human affairs, to technology, sociology, by one of the founders of modern computing, a man called John von Neumann, who said that we're heading to a time when technological advance is so rapid that normal human affairs are going to be unrecognizable. And I think we've got two of these coming. And I've written two books about them. And happily, Abdullah and his colleagues are so generous, they've given you both books in one, called Artificial Intelligence and the Two Singularities. So if you want to know more about this, they're all in the books that you'll be getting. I'm going to take each singularity uh, in reverse order, actually. I'm going to talk very quickly about what's called the technological singularity, which in a word is superintelligence. That is the idea that we create an artificial general intelligence. That's an AI which has all the cognitive abilities of an adult human. I said earlier that what we have now is artificial narrow intelligence, really, really good, superhuman in one narrow respect, like playing chess, and complete rubbish at everything else. An AGI will be, will be human equivalent uh, cognitive abilities in all respects. And because computers can be improved all the time, whereas humans can't, or at least it's very, very slow, they will rapidly become a superintelligence. And they will rapidly be an entity on this planet a hundred times, a thousand times, a million times smarter than the smartest human who ever lived. Now, if that sounds like science fiction, I sympathize, but there are two ways to get there, and at least one of them will almost certainly work. One of them is we just carry on developing the AI that we have now, so deep learning and the earlier form of, of AI that we used to have, symbolic AI. We'll probably need some new conceptual leaps. We don't know. 
And we certainly don't know how long this would take to get us to AGI. Um, but there are people working on this. DeepMind has it as an avowed goal to create an AGI, which they then plan to hand over to the United Nations. So that's jolly nice of them. And best guess, this will take somewhere between 50 and 100 years. Maybe more, probably not less, but that period, quite likely. But if that doesn't work, or before it, there's another way to get there, which is reverse engineering a human brain. So you take a human brain, preferably if you're being polite from somebody who stops using it, you slice it really thinly, and then you scan all those slices. And from that, you make a model of a human brain. It's called the connectome, by analogy with the genome. It's the wiring diagram of the human brain. And if you do it precisely enough, you'll be able to inst instantiate the model of a human brain inside a computer. And it will do what brains do. Brains create minds. Now, again, we don't know absolutely for certain that this is possible, but unless there's magic going on in here, there's no reason why this won't work. And again, we don't know how long it will take, but 50 years or so is a good guess. Now, until quite recently, almost nobody, I was one of a very small number of people who were taking this idea at all seriously, and the technical term for us was crazy. And then we had the three wise men moment, when Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, and Elon Musk all said exactly the same thing. They said, strong AI, super intelligence, is almost certainly coming, and when it gets here, it will either be the best thing or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. And I think there is no finer summary of the situation than that. I think they were dead right. I think it's still true. Now, unfortunately, humans are programmed to pay more attention to bad news than to good news, and so the result was a hell of a lot of pictures of this guy. Um, and why not? It's a wonderful image. Why wouldn't you want to play with this? The possibility of Skynet, which is the idea behind the Terminator franchise, it's a very, very powerful computer system which becomes conscious, has a look at humans and thinks, yuck, I don't like you, I'm going to get rid of you. It's not impossible, but we'd have to be really stupid and really unlucky for that to happen. A much more serious possibility is that we create a superintelligence, and it does, because we've told it to, it does really like us. It just doesn't understand us as well as we need it to. And that's partly because we don't understand ourselves as well as we need to. So it says, I love you humans. I really want to take care of you and make you all happy. So I'm going to put you all in coffins, and I'm going to feed you intravenously, and I'm going to stuff you full of heroin, and you'll be safe forever and happy. Great. Except, obviously, we wouldn't think that was completely brilliant. The, the real threat of superintelligence is not terror as error. However, although there are really, really big downsides, there are also absolutely enormous upsides. And, and Deep Mind, that SAS of Deep Learning in North London, they had this two-step mission statement for themselves and for society as a whole. Step one, solve intelligence. Create an artificial general intelligence. Step two, use that to solve everything else. And they really mean everything else. War, poverty, and this is the one that really gets me, death. We know what causes death through aging. It also gets caused by people running you over, but we know what causes death through aging. It's about seven forms of molecular degradation, and we know how to stop them. It's just the details are phenomenally complicated and hard. But if we have a superintelligence, we could probably solve that problem. Now, if it's true that there'll be a superintelligence on this planet in 50 to 100 years, that means the first people who never need to die have probably already been born. My son, who is 18, is quite likely one of them. I don't know about you, but that blows my mind. It might even be that there's people in this room who will never need to die. I, I find that completely staggering. So I'll leave that one there and go on to the other singularity, which is actually going to happen sooner, and I want to spend a bit more time on this. This is the economic singularity, and it, in a word, it's joblessness through automation. That's three words. Now, automation, of course, is not new. We've had it since well before the start of the Industrial Revolution, and the poster child is the agricultural industry, and the reason for that is the agricultural industry was almost all of the economy for most of human history. In 1800, 80% of all Americans who worked at all worked on farms. In 1900, that number was down to 40%, and now it's down to around about 1%. Now, 
And that was a very uncomfortable transition. A lot of people obviously lost their jobs, they lost their homes, they had to move a long way, and quite a few people died. It was very unpleasant. But in the long run, it wasn't disastrous for humans. It didn't lead to long-term lasting widespread unemployment because it was mechanization. And most past rounds of automation have been mechanization. It's machines taking our muscle power jobs. And when the machines took our muscle power jobs, we had something else to offer. We had our cognitive abilities. So the descendants of all those farm laborers are in this room and working in shops and offices and restaurants all around the world. So it was actually OK for humans. It didn't work out so well for the horse. In 1915, there were 21 and a half million horses in America pulling vehicles around and working on farms. And it turns out 1915 was peak horse. Now, the horse population of America is 2 million. So from 21 and a half million to 2 million. That is very severe technological unemployment. What we have now is a different type of automation. Um, it's not mechanization so much. It's cognitive automation. And that's not entirely new. We've had some before. In 1978, which is more or less when I started working, the most common job description in the states, in all of these blue states, was secretary. And those jobs have been automated, mostly by Microsoft Office. The most common job description now, in the green states, is truck driver. And it won't be for much longer. It won't be when self-driving vehicle technology is ready for prime time. Now, in America, there's about 5 million professional drivers. 3 million truck drivers, and the rest are taxi drivers, van drivers, and so on. In the UK, there's about a million professional drivers. What are those people going to do when they can no longer make money by driving a vehicle? Traditionally, they might well work in a warehouse or at a call center. But we know automation is coming for those. Amazon is spending a lot of its AI R&D on automating the last few bits of warehouse operations that are done by humans. And call centers are going to fall, their job numbers are going to fall to the successes of Siri. But it's a mistake to think that it's just low-paid, blue-collar, repetitive jobs that are going to be automated. There are machines now which can carry out surgery better than human doctors. They're expensive, they're buggy, um, but those limitations will be removed in the coming years. And lawyers, probably for the first time in history, are at the bow wave of technological change. They've given up using quill pens, and now they're finding that disclosure and discovery, where people wade through huge amounts of documents, very, very boringly, looking for that contract which is different from the others, that, machine, that work can be done by machines now. So it doesn't matter whether you're a barrister or a barista. It doesn't matter whether you're blue collar or white collar. The machines are colorblind. They will go for the job of the white-collar person just as much as the job of the blue-collar person who made that white-collar. The thing about machines is they have unfair advantages. They don't get tired. They don't get drunk. They don't fall out with their colleagues. They don't need a day off. They don't sleep. But most of all, unlike us, they're getting twice as good every 18 months. Now, the replacement of... Human jobs by machines is known as substitution to all of the economists in the room. But there's another effect, which means that for quite a long time, we're not going to get technological human unemployment because of this. And that's the complementary effect. The complementary effect says when a job gets automated, that creates additional wealth in the economy. And that creates demand, and that creates new jobs. And as long as machines can't do everything that we can do for money, there'll be lots of jobs for humans. What we are going to see in the next few years and probably decades is the great churn. We're not going to see lasting, widespread, permanent unemployment for a while. We're going to see people needing to change their jobs, change their companies, and change their entire industries more and more often, which means we need to get much better at retraining and reskilling. Now, there are people who say this is the Luddite fallacy. And, um, 
Automation in the past hasn't caused widespread unemployment, and therefore it won't in the future, which is a ridiculous argument because it means that the past is an ironclad guarantee of what will happen in the future, and we'd, we'd know that's not true. If that was true, we wouldn't be able to fly. They also ignore the fact that we have seen massive technological unemployment, if you think about the horse. But the main thing they're doing is they're under, underestimating the amazing growth in the power of AI, and they're thinking too short term. In 20, 30, or 40 years, it is very likely we will see technological unemployment among humans. And the claim that we won't, the claim that this can't happen, is dangerously complacent. You know, I might be wrong, maybe it's not coming, but if we're right, and it is coming, then to just forget about it is a really bad idea. Don't forget, in 10 years' time, the machines we have will be well over 100 times more powerful than they are today, 8,000 in 20 years, a million in 30 years. So some people say, well, all right, you know, the Luddite fallacy is wrong, but we'll invent or create lots of new jobs which machines can never do because they're not conscious, and so they don't have empathy. That doesn't really fly. Um, in Japan, they are running out of people to look after their elder population. They don't really allow much immigration, and they're quite technophile. And so there's a lot more machines looking after elderly people. And it turns out older people really like being looked after by robots. And I suspect the reason is that you can tell a machine the same joke 100 times a day, and it doesn't care. It really doesn't care. And the last resort is, well, hmm, can't tell you what new jobs we will create, but we will create lots of new jobs. Can't tell you what they are because the technology that they depend on hasn't been invented yet. This might be true. I think it's uh, a bit of a slender hope to hang all, all of our a slender thread to hang all of our hopes on. And I also think it's very pessimistic. The idea that we have to do jobs forever is a bit sad. I'm sure everybody in this room loves your job. I bet you bound out of bed every morning thinking, "Yay, I go to work again." I do. And you know what? We're in a very small minority. Most people out there don't really love their jobs. They, it puts food on the table, gives them something to do during the day, but it doesn't give them much fulfillment. If we have a world in which machines do the jobs, we could have a world in which humans do whatever we want to do. We're pampered by the robots, and we become the best artist we can be, the best golfer, the best public speaker, the best writer, the best actuary. Um, we do whatever we want to do. Now, there are, of course, a few little problems with this. Um, one of them, uh, the one that leaps to most people's mind immediately, is, is meaning. Where do we all get meaning in our lives if we don't have jobs? And I actually don't think this is a big problem. It's not negligible, but it's not the big problem, because there's two groups of people who show you do not have to have a job to have meaning in your life. One of them is a group of people who I unfortunately know increasingly more of, and frankly, you all work for, and that is comfortably off retired people. Retiring poor, as you all know very well, sucks. But retiring comfortably is brilliant. No jobs, no lack of meaning. And the other group is aristocrats. For centuries, no jobs, no lack of meaning. Although, unfortunately, some of them did get jobs, unfortunately, for the rest of us. <laughs> so the real problem, I think, isn't meaning, it's money. How do we pay for all the people who no longer have an income? How do we uh, make them all comfortable? And at this point, anybody who is thinking about voting for Jeremy Corbyn jumps up and down and says universal basic income, which is a pretty terrible idea. Um, either UBI is unaffordable or it's not enough. And generally speaking, it's not enough. The little word in the middle of the phrase gives the game away. Basic income is not a solution. It just means that at best we can make everybody poor. And we have to do much better than that. We have to make everybody rich. Now, fortunately, and I put a little flag up, this is another point when I'm going to say something which a lot of you is going to seem completely crazy. I think the answer is abundance. I think what we have to do is to make the cost of all the goods and services that you need for a really, really good standard of living almost free. Not completely free, because I think we want to keep the market. I think, actually, it's pretty impossible to make everything completely free anyway, but I don't think we should try. I don't think we should, go f we should be aiming for fully automated luxury communism, which is a phrase you may have heard. I think we should be aiming for fully automated luxury capitalism. So we make the costs of all the goods and services that you need for a very good standard of living almost free. And yeah, I know, it sounds crazy. But if you think about the music industry, you can see how it might happen. 
When I was young, it was impossible for a rich person to listen to any piece of music that they might want to on a whim. And now, it costs £10 a month. Now, music obviously is digital now, it's weightless, it's um, non-rivalrous and so on. But an awful lot of the economy is like that, and increasingly, more of the economy is going to be like that. In fact, in 10 years or so, an awful lot of people will be spending a great deal of time in virtual reality. So a lot of the economy can go in that direction. But we're still going to have some, some basic physical things. We're going to have to have construction of houses and making of clothes. So can we have constructify, and can we have clothify? And I think the answer is yes, if we do three things. Firstly, we get all the humans out of the production process. Humans are generally the most expensive thing in any production process. So get rid of the humans, and guess what? That's what automation does. Secondly, we make energy really cheap. Most people do not appreciate how quickly solar power is, how quickly it's getting cheaper, and how fast te battery technology is improving. It is generally not true yet that installing solar power is cheaper than digging up dead dinosaurs. But it will be. And we will solve the carbon emissions problem much sooner than we think because of this. And then the third thing we need to do is to make all of our production processes much more efficient, using fewer natural resources, using less energy, because AI runs all the production processes. So I think we can achieve massive cost reduction, and, and we can achieve abundance through that. So there's a really good future scenario. I don't know for sure that this is going to happen. I don't know for sure it's even feasible, actually. I'm not enough of an economist to know it's feasible. I'd, I'd love to work with an economist to work this through and see if it can be done. But I think it can. And I think the real problem is panic. Because I think in somewhere around 10 years, it might be 20, people are going to see so many self-driving cars wandering around, these little robots driving cars around, which is something we don't let humans do until they're adults. And they're going to think, wow, these things are really smart. And they're getting smarter and smarter. They are going to come for my job. And if we don't have a plan, if we're in denial about the possibility of technological unemployment at that point, or if we've got some lunatic idea that somehow UBI will on its own take care of it, then I think we could have a panic. And when we panic, we vote for very, very dangerous politicians and things really just go downhill from there. So to, to summarize the economic singularity argument, technological unemployment isn't coming in the next decade, probably not in the next two decades, but it probably is coming in the next three or four decades. And UBI isn't the answer, but abundance might be. And unfortunately, our politicians, unfortunately Philip's gone, um, are not really paying any attention to this. They are somewhat preoccupied or in even creating the current wave of populism. And we need this to change. So now we get to the, the fourth part, uh, the call to action. I find when I talk to politicians, they don't really get this. It's, it's too far for their planning horizon. It's too big. It's too scary. It's too far away from what they're thinking about at the moment. I find business people really do get it. And I think the reason for that is that business people know you don't need telling anymore. You have to use AI in your businesses, otherwise you know, you're, going to, you're going to lose out to a business that does. And you know that automation's coming. You can see it. So business, business people, I find, do get this message quite quickly. And I need to encourage all of you to take this idea seriously, to think about it, talk about it with your, your friends and colleagues, so that we can collectively build a plan to deal with it. And the other thing I would say to you is, I think it would be a mistake if we try to stop automation. Because automation, replacing human jobs, is one of the things that will create abundance. So I think we should all be automating as fast as we possibly can. Automate and redeploy. Successful companies will automate as fast as they can. Really successful companies will be companies where the employees think, I can be a hero by working out how to, how to automate my job because my company will get me a more interesting, better job if I do that. Those are going to be the star companies of the future, I think. So, to summarize, we have this incredibly powerful technology, which is on an exponential uh, improvement path. We're heading towards these enormous changes. We are not, I believe, in the fourth industrial revolution. 
I think that's a really unfortunate and misleading title. We're in something much bigger than the Industrial Revolution. Humanity's been through four great revolutions. The Cognitive Revolution about 70,000 years ago gave us language and took us from being a pretty irrelevant primate to being the apex predator in the world. The Agricultural Revolution was a really bad deal for individual humans. It was pretty horrible to be a subsistence farmer, much better to be a hunter-gatherer. But for the species, it was great, because we could create food surpluses, we could specialize, and we could create cities. And cities are machines for innovation. And they eventually led to the Industrial Revolution. And that, for better or worse, gave us mastery of the planet. <coughs> but all of that will shrink in comparison to the impact of the Information Revolution, which is what we are now at the beginning of. And we will always be at the beginning of it because of this exponential curve. We stumbled rather blindly through the three previous revolutions. We cannot afford to stumble through the fourth. The technology is too powerful. The downsides are too powerful. But more than all of that, the upside potential is too great. We could have a world where more our children and our grandchildren than ourselves, unfortunately, um, do whatever they want to do. We could have a second renaissance. And then we could have a world in which people don't need to die. We could all live in a state of permanent bliss without losing what we think is essential in ourselves. So if we are conscious, if we go consciously through the information revolution, we can have an incredibly wonderful world. So let's make it so.